This time on Legends, I want to show you a uh, project that I've been working on for a number of years now. It's a uh, Fiamma P4 Prestige from 1974 that was delivered in a very rare color. So we're on our way to my uh, storage facility and I'm going to show you the original 1974 machine and the parts of it that I couldn't save for the current project because there's a few interesting details I think you'll find interesting. So come along with me, it should be fun. So here it is. The one that I am the most interested in is the original heating element, which is integral with the boiler end cap. You can see that there's no separate flange for the element. The uh, element legs go right through the boiler end cap here. The real reason that I did not use this in the current project is because you can see we've got a uh, pretty obscure looking high limit thermostat here, and it just turned itself to dust. There used to be a, uh, an auto reset button here that just kind of fell out. And what we're really trying to do is create a machine that's gonna be fun to play around with. And there's nothing fun about reusing this. This is just gonna cause nothing but problems. And yeah, it would have been nice to be able to save this original frame, but there was just too much deep pitting and heavy rust along the edges and in the box. The 1978 one is identical. It is indistinguishable from the 1974 and it had almost no rust on it. So just simply sending it off for powder coating was all I needed and it came back looking absolutely brand new. group cleaned up a little bit. In terms of the big picture though, it's not all that different from the E61 that preceded it. You've got the paddle on the top rather than on the right. And tipping it to the left opens the brew valve. It admits hot water to the coffee, whereas tipping it back to the right closes the valve and opens any excess pressure from the coffee to drain. But the real star of the show is the means by which we're kicking back that paddle at the end of the shot automatically. And that's this nugget right here. Let's go over the basic components here and then I'll show you the relationship that they have to each other. So here is the water pump. High pressure water goes out into this inlet fitting on the metering valve. And when the metering cylinder is not activated, this valve allows water to flow unobstructed through it to the heat exchanger and then out to the group. When you are Operating the lever in manual mode, you'll notice two things. Number one, when I go to activate a brew cycle, these two plungers are not coming together. And you'll also see this lock lever right here is not catching the brew lever. You have to hold this lever fully on. Now, when we move the selector to a dispensing position. You'll notice this arm has moved to put these two plungers directly in line with each other so that the brew lever will activate the metering valve. You'll also notice that this detent lever has sprung downward and creates 
a lock position so that when you go to dispense a shot and you push, now the lever is locked in the dispense position. Now to help you all understand what's going on inside this giant chunk of metal here, I went ahead and cleaned up some of the major components and got everything freed up so that you could get a look inside and see how the parts interrelate. They were very tightly assembled and there was a lot of lime scale holding them together. So unless you're over the age of 50, you might be saying, what is this madness? Why did we ever need a Rubik's Cube like this just to stop a shot? Well, back in the early 70s, electronic controllers were gigantic, unreliable, and obscenely expensive. You'll find all sorts of mechanical brilliance from this time period employed in tasks that today we take for granted. The microprocessor changed our world by taking the impossible and turning it into child's play. But before then, machines were a steampunk playground. So what are we trying to accomplish here? You know, we still want to be able to use the group manually, but we also want to be able to select from a number of metered brew volumes that will dispense automatically. We want those volumes to be consistent, repeatable, and reliable. The metering valve here cuts off the flow of cold water from the pump and diverts it into the lower half of this chamber that's full of water. It drives the metering piston upward against the spring tension to force out the water trapped above it into the heat exchanger. This is the water that's now making your coffee. Okay. On the bottom of the piston rod is the let off actuator that's going to push the detent lever away from the brew lever and let it snap back to the off position. When that happens, the metering valve will close and allow the spring to push the piston back down and also transfer water from the lower chamber back into the upper chamber so that it can be used again in the next volumetric dose that's selected. Okay, quick reminder to my Patreon supporters that the entire Season 1 is now available to purchase as a DVD box set. You get all the Season 1 episodes plus some really cool bonus features like director's commentary. It was do or die. This episode had to be our breakthrough. If we didn't get the shot or the timing wasn't right, it it, 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 it didn't make the movie. And exclusive interviews with cast members. So, Harold, are you aware that you're a dog? Whoa, what the f***? I've also teamed up with an app developer to offer you the exclusive YouTube comments translator with your purchase. Simply enter the discount code Can I Buy a Vowel at checkout with one mouse click, you can instantly figure out what all these f***ers are trying to say to each other. Here is the absolute entirety of the machine's electrical system. Yep, that's it. Notice that we've got no control board here, no flow meters. We don't even have an autofill circuit. Yep, you had to refill the boiler manually. And if you got it wrong, you'd take out the heating element. Take a wild guess how often that used to happen. Now, if you haven't guessed yet, my favorite part of the older style electrical system was the mercury pressure switches. So the modern pressure stats don't have these. This is a vacuum capsule. So the inside of the capsule is under a full vacuum and you can see we've got some mercury in there. Now, some of the bathrobe wearing members of our audience may correct me on this one, but I believe the reason why mercury switches were attractive is because all of the electrical contact was made and broken by the mercury itself so there was no deterioration of the electrical contacts. You can see that these are just little ceramic spacers to keep the wires apart, but this isn't fully shielded insulation here. This is just like silicone to prevent you from electrocuting yourself if you touched it. Pretty dangerous stuff. Just these little hand wheels here would adjust your on and off pressures. Back here is the ceramic connector that connects the mercury switch to the electrical system, and this is all cloth-bound silicone wire. These weren't an inferior switch. They would tend to last a lot longer than uh, the standard pressure stats that you see today, but the reason that they were taken out of circulation, of course, is because mercury is a known carcinogen and it's been outlawed. Here is where, on a modern machine, you would normally expect to find the control board. There's no control board here whatsoever. Everything is fully analog, on, off. Here's the pink body panels that we were talking about. This is the rare color, and when I say rare, um, there were thousands and thousands of P4s and P6 built during the 1970s. And only a few dozen of them were ever ordered in this pink color. Um, and to make matters more complicated, there were two different shades of pink available. 
Here is the pure pink, and then here is the salmon pink. And on the three group machines, the pink panels are wider on the back. So to find one with all of its panels intact and usable is extremely difficult. I just happen to have an example of each one. Okay, but why are any of these details important? Uh, functionally, they really don't matter at all. As long as it looks not too busted up, most people aren't really going to care. But what you choose to do with it is inextricably tied to your experience and your memory that you are trying to recreate by owning it. The whole goal of owning an antique is enjoyment. You know, the other aspect and benefit of preservation that I don't see talked about at all, uh, but it's very real to me as a technician, is that discovering a new project with untapped potential is exciting because it allows you to insert yourself into the story and become part of the process. You know, for me as a technician, one of the most enjoyable parts of owning a historical artifact is doing the work. All right, so what now? Well, the two group P4 that I've got sitting here is the closest to being finished and it's the most complete. So I'll probably start on it and then we'll move on to the uh, P6 three group if I'm feeling really ambitious. But for now, it's just gonna sit there. So when does collecting become hoarding? Um, it really depends who you ask myself. I prefer to draw the line at when it interferes with the basic necessities of life. Like, you can't cook food because you've got stuff stacked on top of the stove. But I personally don't know anything about that.